Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and told how they did it on cassettes like this and people don't want to listen? How would you explain that? One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy but it's simple here's how you build anything select the right ingredients keep out the wrong ingredients and it starts with thought everything starts with thought so you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything and you decide what goes into your mental factory don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the results the guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing you'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you awake. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. 
All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth. To do the best you can. We keep growing until we're done. Get around successful people and listen. Now, you can also learn from unsuccessful people. Take notes on both, negative and positive. On the negative, the notes are called what not to do. And you got to learn what not to do as well as what to do. So learn from the negative as well as the positive. Find out what poor people read and don't read. But now you can also learn from the positive. Get around successful people. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. It's important. We've all got about 16 waking hours. Practice listening those 16 hours. And I say practice listening because listening isn't easy. I found out it's easier to talk than it is to listen. But if you will practice listening the 16 hours you're awake, sure enough, from surprising sources comes great ideas. Now, here's some of the best advice I've got for the whole evening. It won't get any better than this. This is it. Poor people ought to take rich people out to dinner and listen. That's some of the best I got. If a guy's not doing well, one of the first things he ought to do is find a guy that is doing well and offer to buy him his dinner. Spend 50, 60, 80 hundred dollars. Go for the full nine course. Start him on the juices and hors d'oeuvres. Get him started talking. The salad takes 15 minutes. Keep it rolling. Biggest steak in town takes 45. Keep it rolling. Pour on the dessert. Stretch that meal out about two hours. If you get a successful person to eat and talk for two hours, they're liable to drop ideas in your lap, change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The guy said he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. The words we have are the only words available to us. The words we know are the only tools available to us to, number one, interpret what's going on, to interpret what's being said, and to express your heart and your mind. Now, if you can't interpret well, and if you can't express well, you can imagine what a deterrent that is to the good life and the extra treasures, the extra feelings, awareness, riches, power, influence. So it's very important to have a good vocabulary. It's very important now to be able to translate it, learning to say it well. Now, this is a whole subject in itself. This is worth a weekend of study. Let me just give you a short list of suggestions on learning to say it well. Number one, repetition. It just takes practice. I don't know any substitute for the practice. To learn any skill, you just got to go through it again and again and again. You just do it over and over and often. Next is vocabulary. Saying it well is proper choice of words. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card, put it up on the sun visor, on my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I'd mastered two or three words. Vocabulary. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. One reason for vocabulary is to interpret what we see, to interpret what we hear. The vocabulary of the mind grapples with the words and the images that come to our mind. Now, if you've got a poor set of words and skills and tools with which to interpret, you can imagine the errors and the mistakes you'll make in judgment. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. We do two things with vocabulary. We interpret and we express. Here's some other parts to saying it well. Sincerity, from the heart, with noble intent, wishing to bring value, 
that adds immeasurably to your ability to speak well, communicate well. There's no substitute for sincerity. I can forgive you for a mistaken judgment, but I can't forgive you for a mistaken intent. Next key part to saying it well, brevity. Part of the key is to be brief. You can't linger too long, I've discovered in my lecturing and speaking around the world. You can't linger too long on any one point. I used to tell stories too long, too long. I get involved in a long, long story on and on. By the time I hit the punchline, people forgot how it started. Now it doesn't make sense. Too long. Here's why brevity is important. The human attention span is short. You haven't got long to get it said before you lose your audience. Sometimes we try to make up in words what we lack in self-confidence. So part of the key to being brief is personal development, personal growth, personal awareness, understanding self-worth. Now you can use the economy of words. And this is a good position to be in, that what you are adds so much weight to what you say that you don't have to say very much. But brevity is a good point on saying it well. Here now starts the power of what we say, intensity. Part of the strength of what we say is the words we choose. The greater part of the strength of what we say is the emotions that are loaded into the words. Here's what has power unmatched, words loaded with emotion. There is no greater power. Words have an effect, but words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. My words may reach you, but if I can't touch you with my spirit, if I can't touch you with my emotions, my feelings, my beliefs, then I probably haven't affected you very much. The feelings, the belief, the commitment, all that I am, if I can put more of what I am into what I say, no telling what miracle I can wrought, no telling how much of an effect I can be. Real persuasion comes from putting you into what you say. But now here's part of the clue, and we call these extra refinement of leadership skills, learning to measure your emotions. That's very important to learn to measure your emotions. You don't need an atomic explosion. for a minor point enough but not too much we call this understanding how to measure the flow of your emotions to cover a point okay but if it needs heavyweight stuff you reach and get it if it needs a milder approach you learn how to measure it in milder easier terms but it's very important to measure your emotions your feelings now what do we mean by intensity and emotions here it is all of your experiences and how they've affected you. That's the sum total of your emotional content. Where you've been and what you've heard and what you've seen and who you've met and this whole panorama of life experiences for you up until now and how you felt about all that. That we call the sum total of your emotions. Now the key is to learn how to measure all that and put it in effective amounts into the words you choose. So here's the key to effective communications. Well-chosen words loaded with well-measured emotion. Next is style. And there's all kinds of parts to style, from body language and gestures to facial expressions and eyes and emotion. But style is very important. Here's part of the clue. It's not just the matter you cover, it's the manner in which you cover the matter. Style is important to attract someone's attention to emphasize the point. Now I've got a couple of good points here on style. Be a student of style 
but don't just copy someone's style. Make sure that the study of style becomes distinctly you. But it is also important to be a student of style. How people speak well, be a student of that. And then borrowing bits and pieces from people you admire and the way they can communicate. Then make sure that all of that blended into you becomes your own distinctive style. But style is very important. Now there's a variety of styles. But it's important to study your own style and say, how am I coming across in style? Should I learn to emphasize more? Should I learn to be more emphatic? All these things concerning style. Read your audience. It's very important to read and to pick up the signals of what's happening with your audience. So let me give you some clues on reading. Simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say, what all to say by being a good listener. From early times, I think we've learned to be a good speaker. You've got to be a good listener. That's where you pick up the information, is to listen well, especially in a private conversation, a more informal conversation. Good listening habits. That's part of reading. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day.